thanks for inviting me. Hans, actually, you did a great job in inviting me, because I love to share some of my excellence with you guys on resuscitation. Um, I've been in pre-hospital medicine for 19 years now. First as an ambulance driving next to medical school, afterwards I swapped seats in the car, the position of the ambulance nurse. And um, while I was training for anesthesia, uh, I got a seat in the helicopter, so now I'm a hands physician for about six years. So I've seen it all, I've done it all. I've been there. Well, I'm excellent in airway management, as you mentioned. Thanks for that. Um, nothing to declare so far. Let me summarize this Congress for you. It's all about this slide. It's all about getting the air molecule, the O2 molecule in the head, to uh, well, make sure the patient survives everything. As you guys are sitting here, you're ma managing that yourself. But after an acute stroke or a heart attack or a, a hit on the head, as we have seen in the earlier presentations, we might help the patient a little to uh, continue um, bringing the oxygen to the, um, to the cerebral um, uh, tissue. Okay, well, saying that, as mentioned before, it's all about the airway in the beginning. So I want to uh, talk about the airway first. The A stands for airway. Who does um, perform advanced airway management in the audience? There's a question in the app. Please open the app and answer the question. And it's about emergency airway management. Yep, you got it? In emergency hour management, quite often the first shot is the best shot. So the next question is about what do you think your first pass success rate will be or is? Mine is 93. Thanks. So the airway, the anesthesiologist, the A-team, that's us. We fly across the country to save people, securing airways, cutting, uh, performing a resuscitation. If somebody got stuck, we just cut them up and shoot you to the ventricles. We do it all. We've seen it all, we've done it all. We've seen all kinds of airways in all kinds of situations, and we manage to secure the airway. Because I'm excellent in airway management, I'm often asked to um, be an instructor in the four leather courses you all know, you all done, I guess. ATLS, resuscitation, pediatrics even, pregnant uh, patients. And I always tell them when it comes to airway management, be positive on your tube position. And there's a couple of things you can do. It's quite, sh you're quite sure that the uh, tube is in the right position when you've seen it going through the focal cords. You can listen to the breath sounds. If you have breath sounds, it's probably in the trachea. You can see thorax movements. That's another clue. You can um, add the uh, capnography to your tube. And if you see a curve like this, it's in the trachea, in the lungs, when the patient is circulating or being resuscitated. And I always tell them, when in doubt, take it out. It's easy, right? That's it. Well, it's not that easy. Airway management takes up to 250 intubation exposure before you can insert a tube in 90% of cases in the first attempt. So you need some training, as I need told already. I will present you a case. This was in Rotterdam. It's the, one of the biggest harbors of uh, our country, of the world, actually. And uh, it's a lot of big machines, a lot of steel, 
a lot of rough and tough guys working there. And there was this guy um, taking out sand from the bottom of the uh, water, and the crane um, didn't hold on and just uh, crashed his back. And this guy was standing here, and he got hit by the cables that were, at that time, as big as my upper arms. And um, he was really injured. Because we have a helicopter, and um, as you can see in this picture, it's quite difficult to get there by car, but we can just fly in, in a straight line to here. We were the first team on site. And we, me and the uh, Hems nurse started to uh, take care of the patient. He was lying, he was obviously struck on, his, on the left side of his uh, head. He was fallen on his right side of his thorax, and he was laying on the right side and uh, unconscious. And uh, we, we did a quick exam. We found uh, diminished breath sounds on the right side, on the side he was lying on. And I felt some subcutaneous air. Uh, but his sats were up to uh, uh, 97%. He had a, a quite strong radial pulse, 60. His, uh, he didn't respond to any of our uh, pulses. And, well, I, like I said, he had uh, facial deformities, uh, 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 especially on the left side. Then, the um, ambulance um, arrived, and we all, the Hems nurse and I had already made a plan. We started to uh, well, draw up medicine uh, and uh, the drugs for intubation, because we decided this patient needed a tube. We uh, communicated this with the arrived ambulance, and um, we just briefed, briefly, to put him on his back, put in the tube, and then re-evaluate the patient. Uh, then the um, firefighters came in, and they are responsible for our safety. And there, as you can see, there was another crane up, standing up there, and clouds were moving quite fast. So looking up, it looked like the other crane was moving. So every, everybody in the team, when this um, firefighter mentioned that, was afraid that the other crane would tr come down on us. So he ordered us to pick the patient up and go away. But we just adjusted the uh, anesthetic drugs, so I just decided, well, you know, we just put in the tube, go to the ambulance, and then reevaluate and uh, go on. So I uh, put it in the tube. I'd done it uh, uh, well over a thousand times. The uh, error of the, or the uh, ambulance nurse felt the tube going in. We had the same diminished breath sounds on the right side. We had some cat now, and we just evacuated the patient to the ambulance and reassess them. Then again, we had this diminished breath sounds on the right side. We had some capno, but that was all, it was, the tube was filled with blood, so um, it, it didn't uh, register the, the capno very well, so we changed the filter and the, uh, uh, the sensor. We uh, went to the, uh, to the hospital, and during the transportation, uh, we had to start CPR. We reassessed him. He had turned purple by then. His uh, veins were quite big at that moment. We had diminished breath sounds. I thought I saw a slightly rising right side of the chest. So I just grabbed him out of the chest, put my knife out, and performed a finger thoracostomy. And then we entered the um, emergency department. And while handing over, um, my colleague interrupted me. He's in the, in, in the room as well. He interrupted me, and he wanted to evaluate the tube position. So he put it in the laryngoscope, and he said, no, that's not right. That's in the esophagus. I went back to the helicopter. Crashed, crashed into some of the, uh, uh, the safety guys. And I asked myself, what did just happen? Why did this just happen? What did I miss? And it took a couple of days. No, it took a couple of weeks. It took a couple of months to get rid of this horrible feeling.
I suffered something like what's called the second victim. And I've had it all. I felt guilty, incompetent, inadequate. I had failed the patient very bad. And I was really guessing my skills. There are six stages of getting over this second victim. And the first three stages um, were quite quick, actually the same day, or the two days after. And after that, you got called by the boss. And all these questions popped my head, and the heads of the people I was talking to. And I was really doubting my excellence, my skills. Was I as good as I thought I was? Another question for you guys. It's in the app. <laughs> You've seen it already. All right. Was I really this excellent in airway management? There's a psychological phenomenon known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. You probably have heard of it. It's, um, it's quite interesting to read about. It's 85% of all people with a driving license think their performance are above average. And it's not only in driving cars. It's in all kind of discipline. Actually, the people with the less experience tend to overestimate themselves the most. On the other hand, the people who are experts tend to decrease and tend to uh, think that everybody else is, well, at least a little bit as experienced as they are. And the, um, the novice are double cursed. People lacking knowledge and skills suffer a double curse. They make mistakes and reach poor decisions. And at the same time, their knowledge gaps that we all have prevent them from reaching and catching their errors. So they're not able to perform the procedure right, and they're not able to evaluate themselves right. And that's what Rainier thought. It's all about debriefing. It's all about experts telling the novice um, what is the right way to do it. Because they tend not to do to, uh, they are not able to very good um, evaluate their own skills and knowledge. There's another mechanism to it. The more you know, the more you know that you don't know. And people who have limited knowledge tend to overestimate their knowledge and think they know all there is to know. This is an interesting graph. This is made fun of sometimes. This is what I told you about the, um, the novice who have some kind of knowledge and experience, who are overconfident. This peak is called Mount Stupid. <laughs> and I've reckoned myself to be, for a very long time, on Mount Stupid. And that day in the harbor, I fall off in the valley of despair, doubted my skills, of course it's not 
um, the Dunning-Kruger effect alone. There's just the part of me feeling uh, unconfident after this happened. There was fixation error, Tom has already told about in, uh, this morning. And I think in our case, I just, um, I was this one. It will be fine. A little bit of that one. It can be anything but the tube. And then later on, because we had this full evaluation, of course, I asked the um, ambulance nurses. They didn't doubt the tube at all, because I was the anesthesiologist putting it in. There are some residents of mine in the room. They, slight, uh, I, I see relief faces when I enter the uh, trauma bay, because when uh, things are done by me, it will be right. I've heard it a, a couple of times because I'm fixated on it since it ha this happened. It was the hands nurse who doubted it, but didn't speak up. So for us, lessons learned. Uh, we should, um, after, in every 10 seconds, take the 10 seconds for 10 minutes. We've heard it uh, earlier this morning. Um, that's what we in our team need to do more. And I have to check, act, check, act, plan, and so on and so on. I teach it all the time, but I didn't do it because stress levels went up when firefighters um, uh, well, ordered us to go on. So, back to the Dunning Kruger. We're all in it. It's happening to all of us. We all have knowledge gaps. So be aware and ask for feedback from the real experts. I hope um, my presentation on killing a patient helps you preventing from doing the same. And uh, when arguing to a fool, Make sure the other person isn't doing the same. Thank you.